Good afternoon, saints. I'm Richard Spivey, associate minister at the Convent Avenue Baptist Church. Well, last week's Bible study was supposed to be on 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 15 about Paul and the false apostles. So I'll, I'll summarize the important verses of part one that correspond to this latter part of the chapter, which are verses 16 through 33, known as Paul's suffering as an apostle. I'm praying this lesson will encourage, strengthen, and enlighten you to endure any false allegations and troubles that may come your way. For as followers of Christ, we all must, like the apostle Paul, endure the things of this world. But I want to remind you that we're never alone. Will you please join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, it gladdens us that all things are in your hands. Without you, we could do nothing and are nothing. With Christ as our big brother and savior, you make all things possible with your abundant favor and blessings. We cherish you for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you will be doing in our lives. Now, Lord, touch our hearts and illuminate our minds that we may learn more about you and serve you better. Fill us this day with your Holy Spirit. And we offer this prayer with thanksgiving and gratitude in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, to summarize 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 15, in verse 1, Paul plays the fool to draw the people's attention, saying, I hope you will put up with me in a little foolishness. Yes, put up with me. Now, perhaps this technique kept their focus because they most likely thought he was confessing to the allegations made by the super apostles mentioned in verse 5. But Paul's purpose was to hold their minds in a place where he could reverse the circumstances on them and make them see how naive and foolhardy they were. For in verse 3, he scolds them. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ reminding them of the devil's trickery. In verses four and five, counter charges the uh, super apostles for preaching a Jesus other than the Jesus he preached, bringing a different spirit from the spirit they first received, a different gospel from the one they previous believed, and they easily fell for it. He always says, I do not think I'm the least inferior to those super apostles, speaking of those that brought the false charges of his money laundering. But in verses eight and nine, Paul states, I robbed other churches receiving support from them so as to serve you. And the brothers from Macedonia supplied what I needed. It's not that Paul actually stole from the church, those churches, but that they sent monies to support his ministry in Corinth. He goes on to bring strong allegations against his accusers saying, for such people are false apostles, deceitful workers masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if he if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness, their end will be what their actions deserve. That's 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. Now these are strong recriminations that lifted and shifted the guilt from Paul to them. So these verses were the most important to me in 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 15 and should give you some idea of what part one is about. Now let's move on to verses 16 through 33, 
But at your convenience, please read verses 1 through 15. So our text for today is 2 Corinthians 11, 16 through 33, and I'm reading from the NIV version. And it reads, <clears throat> pardon me, I repeat, not, let no one take me for a fool, but if you do, then tolerate me just as you would a fool, so that I may do a little boasting. In this self-confident boasting, I am not talking as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many are boasting in the way the world does, I too will boast. You gladly put up with fools since you are so wise. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or slaps you in the face. To my shame, I admit that we were too weak for that. Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I am speaking as a fool. I also boast, dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this, but I am more. I have worked much harder, been in pr prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods since I was pelted with, once I was pel pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night, I spent a night and day on the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressures of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak? I do not feel weak. Who is led into sin? I do not inwardly burn. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I'm not lying. In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas had the city of the Damascus guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Please allow me to begin, uh, to begin with saying that the Apostle Paul never claimed to be the founder of Christianity, but maintains that he meditates, facilitates, and transmits the gospel only as an evangelist. At the same time, he develops crucial elements of early Christian belief, thinking, and communicating by, for instance, shaping a moral discourse and transforming the Jesus story into a metaphorical complex. However, as an epistolary activist, Paul might be called the founder of early Christian literature. The, the, Christ, the uh, Corinthian correspondence impressively documents how the Apostle Paul, as a missionary founder and leader of communities, moral teachers, letter writer, and theologian, constantly reacts to the gospel interpretation at a time when Christian discourse was just beginning to develop. And Christianity as we know it today was in the making. This was a necessity even for us today. Many believe or un and are unable to defend the faith or even their anointing. 
Therefore, the apostle leaves us many standards for evangelistic ministry with all its challenges and suffering. We must keep in mind that Paul thought himself to suffer as Christ suffered for us when he sacrificed his precious blood and gave us undeserved favor in his name. We learn that in verse 1, Paul has used the technique of playing the fool to teach the Corinthians about their own foolishness. However, in verse 16, he again demands, let no one take me for a fool and cajoles them to put up with his boasting. But again, we have to refer to 1 Corinthians 1.31 when he said, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For as Christians, boasting is delusional and self-illuminating. With this statement, Paul identifies two types of boasting, the improper boast about oneself and the proper boasting about the Lord, represented by his rivals and himself, respectively. And surely as we read these verses, we will learn that Paul's boasting is truly about what the Lord has brought him from and through and nothing he's done on his own. Allow me to say that boasting in the Lord is a form of praise, worship, and understanding that very few comprehend unless they have experienced something similar to what believers have been through. This reasons why others give you a strange eye when the Spirit hits you in your praise. They just don't know what the Lord brought you through. And like Paul, let us praise the Lord for not leaving us in our conditions and looking like what we've been through. So in verse 16, Paul again resorts to the technique of playing the fool, only to keep them captivated and hold their minds focused on what the Lord has done for him, for them, and in our application is doing for us. Paul is actually saying, let no one take any pleasure in doing foolishness or that I do it with an extraordinarily strong reason. Let the provocation I have of my opponents be considered. Let the necessity of the circumstance and the importance of my character be duly weighed, and so you need to excuse my actions. Here Paul brings to our attention that one must be wise enough to play the fool, and to do that well must have some kind of wit by taking into account the mood of the people and the quality of the, and the quality of the persons need to be observed along with the correct timing. It's not an easy practice because a wise person's art must fit the circumstance to which it's applied. In verse one, Paul politely requests the Corinthians pardon his foolishness, but this time he demands, I repeat, let no one take me for a fool, but if you do then tolerate me just as you would a fool so that so that I may do a little boasting. Paul was a Hebrew, and since he didn't believe he was very fluent in the various Greek dialects and idioms, as you'll see in verse six, he replied or relied on other ways to capture and hold their attention. Again, he depends on their thinking he's about to plead guilty to the false charges brought against him, but turns the tables on them once again to show how naive and blind they are for believing the super apostles referred to in 2 Corinthians 11.5. I don't believe we'll ever find out for sure how the Corinthians carried on after Paul's departure but take into consideration they may be included in the reprimand to the Ephesian, Pergamum, and Laodicean churches in Revelations 2 and 3. Paul's opponents could have been the remnant class of the chief priests and Pharisees spoken of in Matthew 21, 44 through 46. Again, in 2 Corinthians 17, as in verse 1, 
Paul requests tolerance from the Corinthians for his foolishness and explains why. In this self-confident boasting, I am not talking as the Lord would, but as a fool. He is not speaking like he's the Lord, so he calls himself a fool because only fools boast of their own accomplishment, not, real, not realizing it is God who allows us to succeed our past and our incompetence. You see, since Paul's encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road in Acts 9, his commitment to Christ rose to its apex and he learned that every prophet, priest, king, prime minister, and even president throughout history have not gained power of their own accord, but only by God's appointment. Two good examples are Nebuchadnezzar in 2 Kings 24 and Cyrus in 2 Chronicles 36, who God used as tools to punish and free Israel respectively. This though this also applies to our postmodern era rulers as well. And I would be remiss for not explaining that Paul was very a very misunderstood apostle, most likely because he didn't receive his commission in the same manner as the 12 disciples. He makes the confession, but clearly intends to transform the obvious deficiency of his apostleship into a strength. In Paul's words, last of all, as to one untimely born, speaking of his late commission, he, <clears throat> pardon me, he, Christ, appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. That's 1 Corinthians 8 through 10. Paul's was an alternate path taken by God because the Jews who Jesus first came to save and free did not receive Jesus to spread the gospel to the nations. So Paul was sent to the Gentiles for as it is written, he, Jesus, came unto his own and his own received him not. John 1 11. If you know the history of the biblical characters like Nebuchadnezzar, you'll agree that they caused nations to suffer, except Cyrus, who saw the power of the true and living God, understood his appointment, paid out of his kingdom's wealth for the Israelites to return to Jerusalem for the building of the temple of God, as written in 2 Chronicles 36, where Cyrus himself explains, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed to me a a, uh, to build a temple for him in Jerusalem and Judah. Any of his people among you may go up and may the Lord, their God, be with them. Isaiah 45, 1 and 13 respects this saying, this is what the Lord says to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their armor to open doors before him so the gates will not be shut. I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I will make all his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free, but not for price or reward, says the Lord. And even Ezra 6.3 agrees that in the first year of King Cyrus, the king issued a degree, decree concerning the temple of God in Jerusalem. Let the temple be rebuilt as a place to represent sacrifices and let its foundations be laid. God used Cyrus for his purpose and for the good of his people in the first year of his rulership. So the Lord may suffer us to bad times like the Israelites as a consequence for our disobedience, but keep in mind that when we repent, he makes it, as it often said, a way out of no way to redeem us. For if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will 
be saved. Saved from the wickedness of this world. Saved from the evils of our past, the stinking thinking of our present, and thus saved from sin, death, and the grave. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Hallelujah to the name of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 11, verses 17 through 20, Paul admonishes the Corinthians for their naive foolishness by reflecting on their being tricked while thinking they, they're so wise, but are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You see, see that in Revelation 3.17 on the Laodicean uh, the sea in church. And he further furthers it by saying, in fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you and puts on airs or slaps you in the face. I want you to also read Revelation 2.20 on tolerance. It's our naivete that allows foolishness in our midst. So Paul is submitting his own allegations and recriminations against the Corinthians and the super apostles with their enslaving, exploiting, taking advantage of, putting on airs, and insultingly slaps in the face. We should all know about those who masquerade in church faces but are putting on airs. They enslave our minds about making us believe they're righteous followers of Christ sent by God, which is the exploitation and advantage taking of our pure thinking of them that's like a slap in the face. I'm sorry to say this, but it happens from the pulpit to the door in many churches, and it is our obligation to discern the spirit of them that would deceive us. For it is written, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 John 4, 1. Such people may not realize they've been lured by Satan who uses both demonic and human agency to do his evil biddings. But now Paul continues speaking to us of his superior character, his superior ancestry and superior apostleship through Christ Jesus in verses 21 to 23. He says, to my shame, I admit that we are too weak for that, talking of the foolishness of the super apostles. Whatever anyone dares to boast about, I am speaking as a fool to boast. I also dare to boast about. This is a kind of twisted phraseology on what he means about boasting, but gets the point across that we are fools to boast of our own accomplishments instead of what God in Christ has done for us and through us. He speaks of his superior ancestry in verse 22 to perplex their uncertain, uncertainty, saying, they are, he, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this, but I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have, gone, have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Paul establishes the thought that those who suffer so many of these ills cannot be false in their ministry, for as Satan tried to deter the crucifixion, 
so he does the same in our ministry with unscrupulous actions. The apostle has suffered all these things and through Christ endured to continue his ministry. And I must say that anyone suffering this much and continues the Lord's work has to be anointed of God and not be a super apostle as he boasts of his weakness and sufferings unlike the super apostles. Such suffering, Paul argues, is a true sign of apostleship or even discipleship. So he speaks of his superior apostleship in verse 23. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more an apostle. I have worked harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. For without suffering, we cannot prove our faithfulness to Christ because Christ suffered for us. If we carefully read verse 22, Paul subtle, subtly identifies the super apostles as Israelites or Jews, the descendants of Abraham. This relinquishes the possibility of any biblical scholar determining they were anyone else than Jews. And then he brags about his servitude to Christ more than them for the Jews were given the oracles of God but failed to teach others about the word, Christ, salvation, and the kingdom of God. And they wanted Gentiles to be circumcised and keep the laws of Moses as written in Acts 5.15.5. Or 5, or 15, 5. When Paul was, has already taught the superior, superiority of the gospel over the law. The above accounts of Paul's apostolic sufferings can be verified through the book of Acts, which tells the history of what he endured through Jewish persecution, unfair judicial decisions, almost losing his life on the stormy seas, whippings, lashings, stonings, and being left for dead. So to verify what he's saying in 2 Corinthians 11, in Acts 3 through 15, the Jews of Antioch and Iconium go so far as to stalk Paul and incite the crowds to violence against him. He had already been stoned and left for dead once. And in Philippi, once a Roman colony, Roman magistrates beat and jail Paul and his companions on behalf of the Gentiles. Now, I know this seems like I'm going off the beaten track, but we can learn much more if we go to Acts 27, 13 through 44. For it is written that Paul's close encounter with danger, doubt, and death at sea were nullified because in verse 24, an angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. This is where the Lord makes Paul live to go to Rome with the purpose of converting some of the religious Jewish leaders. We may know why God, we may not know why God does things like this until they happen. The power of Paul's commitment to Christ placed the lives of his fellow passengers in his hands. In other words, nothing drastic would happen to them as it would not happen to Paul. And later I'll tell you a little story about a woman going to jail as an example. For days on end, they all survived the outright darkness of the storm as the sun and stars did not appear throughout the turbulence, Acts 27:20. After the ship was demolished, they were saved from being swept away and drowned. Though so Paul testifies, once we were safe on shore, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. The people of the island were very kind to us. It was cold and rainy, so they built a fire on the shore to welcome us. As Paul gathered an armful of sticks, he was laying them on the fire and a poisonous snake driven out by the heat bit him on the hand. The people of the island saw it hanging from his hand and said to each other, a murderer, no doubt. 
through his escape, though his escape, his though he escaped the sea, justice will not permit him to live. But Paul shook off the snake into the fire and was unharmed. The people waited for him to swell up and suddenly drop dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw he wasn't harmed, they changed their minds and decided he was a god, Acts 28, 1 through 6. Paul then makes them cease worshiping him as a god. And it's a great lesson for us not to think too highly of ourselves, but of the power of God. For the Lord says to prove some of Paul's uh, things that he went through, <clears throat> these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And if they drink anything poison, any deadly poison, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall be made well. Of course, this is only part of the events of Paul's ministry, for he survived the snake bite on the island of Malta, freed a slave girl from demonic possession in Acts 16, 16 through 24, and restored the life of the young Eutychus, who fell out of a three-story high window and died during one of Paul's long sermons. You'll find that in Acts 27 through 12. After all these horrendous events, Paul ultimately arrives in Rome to be judged by Caesar. But not, not only was he a Hebrew, but a Roman citizen as well. Upon his declaration and upon his declaration of that citizenship, he would stand trial and not be executed by the Jews. I want you to know there will always be those in opposition to God's children to the extent of wanting to kill them. But if it be God's will, we will not taste of that bitter cup. Now, although Paul was in prison, ended up, it ended up a two-year sanctuary rather than being housed as a common criminal. The apostle was permitted to live in his own rented dwelling, though bound with chains and in the company of a guard and was daily allowed visitors. You can read all of that in Acts 28, 16 and 30, and you can cross-reference uh, Ephesians 6, 20. Now, we may find ourselves locked up, but there, but only there for God's purpose. And as the latter portion of Acts 28 su su uh, summarizes two meetings that Paul had with the uh, Romans, Rome's leading Jews, and while some of them stubbornly believed his message, disbelieved his message, others were persuaded by the things he proclaimed, Acts 28, 24. This was the commitment or commencement of a faithful ministry in that city, which extended to its outer regions and is a lesson not only for Paul, but for us also that we persuade those who disbelieve even our strongest enemies. Now, here's the short story I said I would tell you about uh, so that we could know how and why God does certain things. I once heard a story of a drug abusing homeless woman who fell asleep in a stolen car driven by two men who had drugs in their possession. She had no idea the vehicle was stolen and waking up behind bars a few days later, a stranger came to visit her, put money in her commissary and gave her a Bible. She didn't know the stranger, but she knew it was only God who had sent her. Later, she meets a young girl convicted of murder. But it was the girl's boyfriend that did the killing. And so she convinced the young girl that her boyfriend was trying to lay all the charges on her to free himself and advised the girl to call her parents and get a lawyer. The girl was eventually set free. So you see, God places us where he knows we're best needed. 
And Paul's meeting with the Jews in Acts 28, 24 persuaded many to repent and, conver and convert. Paul avows to his God-given advantages by the history of his trials and shows his deep concern and endurance and truthfulness in 2 Corinthians 11, 28 through 31, which says, besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not, do not feel weak? Who is led to sin and I do not burn inwardly? The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I'm not lying. He is attesting that God knows the truth about our strengths, weaknesses, and our testimonies. But later we may find it funny how in the very same city where Paul wanted to incarcerate Christians, that he tells of his near arrest and escape. In Damascus, the governor under the king Aretas had the city of the Damascus guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window and a wall and slipped through his hands. Second Corinthians 11, 32 and 33. Didn't Jesus escape the Jews in John 8, 59 by slipping through their hands? And now Paul is protected in the same manner. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as Christ suffered for our salvation, we too must suffer. Not only because the world hates us, but to aid the very same unbelieving people for God has purpose in their lives as well. As well. We should never cry, woe is me, because we are sent to sacrifice ourselves for peace, justice, fairness, and God's truth. And oftentimes we may face death, but it may never touch us. It is written, behold, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves, Matthew 10:16. Thus the Apostle Paul declares, in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily, 1 Corinthians 15, 31. And we need to think of ourselves as dying daily for Christ. This is our manner of boasting, although it's foolish to many who hear it, it is our commitment to Christ who strengthens us in all things, Philippians 4:13. As Paul's authority was questioned, we too may be met with challenges, but when we're anointed and sent by God, Romans 8.31 says, if God be for us, who can be against us? We do not stand on the high and vertical precipice of danger and death like others do, but on the solid rock of our salvation in whom we are redeemed and have everlasting life. All praise belongs to God for his faithfulness, his mighty acts of exoneration, his provision and his protection. We must admit we cannot do anything in and of ourselves, but that it's the Lord who performs what's impossible to us. At times it may appear that God has forsaken us, but depend on his promise when he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, Hebrews 13, 5. He created all things and all beings to live on the earth and thus he controls everything there is and is there in the midst of our struggles. It is he who was and is and is to come. Bless the holy and mighty name of Jesus. So today we've again learned how to trace Paul's history and where to back up the story of his suffering and how he got where he is in God's mission. It is of the utmost importance that we learn the correct and proper biblical interpre uh, interpretation through correct cross-referencing because truth 
relies on understanding the scripture in full. For it is also written, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the person of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Second Timothy 3, 3, 16 and 17. So let us have a word in prayer to close out. Our Lord and our God, in gratitude, we give you thanks. Forgive us our doubts for when we're in fear of danger, for you do not give us the spirit of fear. Please continue to carry us in your hands as Christ's prayer in John 17, and keep us from all harm, seen and unseen. When we look to the sky, when we feel the earth beneath our feet, and we see how you provide for us, we know it is no one but you who stands by our side in all situations. With our mouths, we continually bless you, praise you, and worship you, Lord God. And we offer this prayer in the mighty name of Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen and amen. May the remainder of your day be blessed by the love and peace of our Lord. Christ Jesus.